How long did it take to process that sequence? How long did it take to get the genetic code for? Um, for the Archbishop, it took much longer because, um, because of money. We had no money to do the project, so it was as we could get philanthropic money in, we did sequences so bit, of, bit and bit at a time. But nowadays, um, you know, last week, I did a human genome in eight days. In eight days? Yes. Is the plan to eventually be able to do it more like hours or minutes than eight days? Uh, absolutely. How, um, how fast eventually and by when could we do? You know, we talk about a five to ten year plan where everybody can go to their physician and, and have their DNA sequenced. I don't think it's... Um, you know, this is science fiction anymore, it is reality. We will get to that point. Um, we have to bring the cost down still. Uh, it's still very expensive. Um, and on the other scale, we have to bring, sure, but faster. But we really have to be able to work with the data a lot better. Um, so currently, although we're generating huge amounts of data, what the field has happened in the field is there's more competition out there. So we have more technologies to use. And now we're not comparing apples with apples anymore. We're kind of comparing apples with peaches, with oranges and bananas. And we've got to still work out how to deal with all that um, noise that we have in the information. When we can get to that point, it will be reality. We're also on a larger scale comparing humans and animals. There, there's thousands of animals we're now cracking the code. Mm -hmm. of why are we doing that? Because a whole new field has come out called comparative genomics. If we want to understand how our DNA and how our code impacts our life and has, has formed us into who we are today, we need to look at our animal, plankton, all our cousins that are out there, anything with DNA that lives. Because there are signatures in all species on this planet. Whether we can see the species or not see the species, maybe living in the ocean somewhere and we can't even see it but it's a species that's living, that tells us how that code functions. And this is what we want this amazing field to be in. You've done some work recently published on the Tasmanian Devil. What did you find there? So the Tasmanian Devil, as you know, is suffering from uh, facial cancer. And uh, what is unique about that cancer is an infectious cancer. So to try and understand um, the, the impact of this disease on the Tasmanian Devil, being a very ancient species, a marsupial, we needed something to work from. So the scientists around Australia are doing fantastic work in trying to understand the complexities of this infectious cancer where you can pass it on just by touching one another. There's only two types occurring naturally in the world. And uh, to, so it's a model for us to understand, but we need to have something to work from. So we first had to sequence the, the Tasmanian devil itself. So there was a basis to, uh, to, to base the, the research on, and then of course understand the cancer. You mentioned the resistance that the Archbishop's people had to you doing this, and there are, mm -hmm. there are lots of reasons for Indigenous people around the world to be hesitant when organisations claim they want a bit of them for science. Do we still have a long way to go in that regard? A very long way, yes. There is still a lot of resistance. Um, uh, it's probably, one of the biggest questions I get in my career weekly um, is to answer questions and to address concerns about ethical issues in Indigenous research. And um, unfortunately, there has been a lot of damage done in the past, and people remember that damage. And we as scientists have a, um, a big job to do. We have to go out and correct the damage that has been done, and to not forget about the social side of what we do. When we go out and we are working with Indigenous people, they also have um, their own needs and we have to address it. And we can do that. A science can be very embracing and very empowering. You mentioned earlier that I'm probably about 3% Neanderthal. Yes. Is, is, is everyone in the room about 3% Neanderthal or was that, was that just me? Um, well, you may be more. <laughs> no. what, what, do, what, um, what does it mean to be 3% Neanderthal? Okay. Are, are we all roughly the same if amount you, if, if you're European or Asian, you're probably between 1% and 4% Neanderthal, yes. Um, so this is work um, which only was made possible by the technologies that we now use, where the end of last year, uh, Svante Parva's group from the Max Planck Institute managed to sequence the entire genome of, um, of the Neanderthal. Um, too low coverage, but, but still generated that sequence. And what they found was in the past, we always believed that we never interbred with the Neanderthal. 
And that was because the information was based just on genetic data we get from our mother's line. And that led to the skewing in the information. So now what they find by being able to look at the whole genetic data is that we did interbreed with the Neanderthal, but it was always from Neanderthal male to Homo sapiens sapien female. And that's why the contribution in our genomic profile came from the male's line. But it only occurs within people that left Africa. We do not find that within Africa. Okay. When you're not working very hard on this incredible research, your kids are teaching you surfing and you still enjoy kickboxing as well. <laughs> Which are you better at, surfing or kickboxing? Oh, absolutely kickboxing. Yeah? Yeah. You can do something constructive with that. <laughs> hey, that might be a good note on which to wrap it up. Please give her a massive round of applause. What an amazing career in current research. Vanessa Thank Hayes, you. lovely to speak with you.